I used to distract myself some mornings before I got out of bed by uh, pressing the television remote control gadget from one channel to another. This may be the only way to watch TV. Oh, I certainly saw some remarkable sights. <laughs> Blondes and brunettes and possibly redheads. My screen was colorless, washing their hair, relentlessly smiling, teeth gleaming like the grill work of automobiles. <laughs> Breast firmly, chillingly encased package, as it were, and brilliantly uplifted forever. All sagging, corrected, forever. All middle-aged bulge. Middle-aged bulge. <laughs> Defeated eyes as sensuous and mysterious as jelly beans. Lips covered with something. Hair sprayed to the consistency of aluminum. Girdles forbidden to slide up, <laughs> stockings defeated in their subversive tendency to slide down, to turn crooked, to snap, to run, to tear. Hands prevented from aging by incredibly soft detergents. Fingernails forbidden to break by superbly smooth enamels. Teeth forbidden to decay by mysterious chemical formulas. All conceivable body odor, no matter what con contingency, prevented for 24 hours of every day. Forever and forever and forever. <laughs> Tobacco robbed of any harmful effects by the addition of a mint. The removal of nicotine, the presence of filters, and the length of the cigarette. Tires, which cannot betray you. Automobiles that will make you feel proud. Doors, which cannot slam on those precious fingers or fingernails. Diagrams illustrating, proving how swiftly impertinent pain can be driven away. Square-jawed youngsters dancing. Other square-jawed youngsters armed with guitars or backed by bands howling. All of this and so much more punctuated by the roar of great automobiles, overtaking gangsters, the spatter of Tommy guns mowing them down. News, news, news. From where? Dropping into the sea with the alertness and irrelevancy of pebbles. Sex wearing an aspect so implacably dispiriting that even masturbation, by no means mutual, seems one of the possibilities that vanished in Eden. Sex of an appalling coyness, often in the form of a prophylactic cigarette being extended by the virile male towards the aluminum and cellophane girl. <laughs> ah, they happily blow smoke into each other's face. <sighs> Jelly bean. Brilliant with desire, grow work gleaming, perhaps poor, <sighs> betrayed exiles. They're trying to discover if behind all that grow work, all those barriers, either of them has a tongue. <laughs>
the American myth. The myth tells us that America is full of smiling people. Ah, we have all heard the bit about what a pity it was that Plymouth Rock didn't land on the pilgrims <laughs> instead of the other way around. <laughs> I have never found this remark very funny. It seems uh, wistful and vindictive to me, containing furthermore a very bitter truth. The inertness of that rock meant death for the Indians, enslavement for the blacks, and spiritual disaster for those homeless Europeans who now call themselves Americans and would never have been able to resolve their relationship either to the continent they fled or to the continent they conquered. Leaving aside, as we mostly imagine ourselves to be able to do, those whom we quaintly refer to as uh, minorities, who without the most tremendous coercion, coercion, indistinguishable from despair, would ever have crossed the threatening ocean to come to this desolate place. I know the myth tells us that heroes came looking for freedom. Well, heroes are always by definition looking for freedom and no doubt a few heroes got here too. One wonders how they fared. And though I rarely see anyone smiling here, I'm prepared to believe that many people are. Though God knows what it is they're smiling about. But the relevant truth is that the country was settled by a desperate, divided, and rapacious horde of people who were determined to forget their pasts and determined to make money. We have certainly not changed in this respect, and this is proved by our faces and our children, by our un absolutely unspeakable loneliness and the spectacular ugliness and hostility in our cities. Our cities are terribly unloved by the people who live in them. I mean, no one seems to feel that the city belongs to him. Despair. Perhaps it is this despair which we should attempt to examine if we hope to bring water. <laughs> It has always been much easier because it has always seemed much safer to give a name to the evil without than to locate the terror within. Yet, the terror within is far truer and far more powerful than any of our labels. Ah, the labels change, the terror is constant. And this terror has something to do with that mm, irreducible gap between the self one invents, the self one takes oneself as being, which is, however, and by definition, a provisional self, and the undiscoverable self, which always has the power to blow the provisional self to bits. Mm. 
It is possible, indeed, it is far from uncommon to go to bed one night or to wake up one morning and uh, simply walk through a door one has known all one's life and discover that between inhaling and exhaling, that the self one has sewn together with such effort is all dirty rags, is unusable, is gone. And out of what raw material will one build oneself again? The lives of men, and therefore of nations to an extent literally unimaginable, depend on how vividly this question lives in the mind. It is a question <laughs> that can paralyze the mind, of course, but if the question simply does not live in the mind, then one is simply condemned to eternal youth, which is a synonym for corruption. Don't stop I have not heard anyone singing in the streets of New York for more than 20 years. By singing, I mean singing for joy, for the hell of it. I don't mean the drunk and lonely 4 a.m. keening, which is simply the sound of some poor soul trying to vomit up his anguish and gagging on. Where the people can sing, the poet can live. And it is worth saying the other way around too. Where the poet can live, where the poet can sing, the people can live. When a civilization treats its poets with disdain with which we treat ours, it cannot be far from disaster. It cannot be far from the slaughter of the innocents. Everyone is rushing. God knows where. And everyone is looking for God knows what. But it is clear that no one is happy here and that something has been lost. <sighs> Only sometimes. Uptown, along the river, perhaps. I have sometimes watched strangers here, here for a day or a week or a month or newly transplanted. Hmm. Watch the boy and a girl or a boy and a boy or a man and a woman or a man and a child or a woman and a child. Yes, there was something recognizable, something to which the soul responded, something to make one smile, even to weep with exultation. They were yet distinguishable from the concrete and the steel. One felt that one might approach them without freezing to death.
friend of mine and myself were arrested on Broadway in broad daylight while looking for a taxi. He had been here for three days and not yet mastered English, and I was showing him the wonders of the city of New York. He was impressed and bewildered, though he also seemed rather to wonder what purpose it served when suddenly, whoa, down from heaven or up through the sidewalk, two plainclothes men appeared, separated us. Scarcely a word was spoken. I watched my friend, carried by the scruff of his neck, vanish into the crowd. Not a soul seemed to notice. Apparently, it happened every day. I was pushed into the doorway of a drugstore and first made to empty my pockets, made to pull up my sleeves, ask what I was doing around here, around here, being the city which I was born. Now, I'm an old hand at this. Policemen have always loved to pick me up and sometimes to beat me up, so I said nothing during the entire operation. I was worried about my friend, who might fail to understand the warmth of his reception in the land of the free. Worried about his command of English, especially confronted with the somewhat special ram used by the police. Neither of us carried knives or guns, neither of us used dope. So much for the criminal aspect. Furthermore, <laughs> my friend was a married man with two children here on a perfectly respectable visit, and he had not even come from some dirty and disreputable place like Greece, but from geometric and solvent Switzerland. So much for more. I was not exactly a bum either, so I wondered what the cop would say. He seemed <laughs> extremely disappointed that I carried no weapons and that my veins were not punctured. Disappointed and therefore more truculent than ever. I conveyed to him with some force that I was not precisely helpless and I was perfectly able and more willing to cause him a great deal of trouble. What exa why exactly had he picked us up? He was now confused, afraid, and apologetic, which caused me to despise him from the bottom of my heart. And he said, how many times have I heard this? That there had been a call out to pick up two guys who looked just like us. White and black, you mean? Apart from my friends, I think I can name on the fingers of one hand all the Americans I have ever met who were able to answer a direct question, a real question. Well, not exactly. Hell no. He had not even known the other guy was white. He thought that he was Puerto Rican, which said something very interesting, I think, about the eye of the beholder, like, as it were, to like. Therefore, he was in a box. It was not going to be a simple matter of apologizing and letting me go. Unless he was able to find his friend and my friend, I was going to force him to arrest me and then bring false charges for false arrests. So, not without difficulty, we found my friend who had been released and was waiting in the bar around the corner from our house. He also had baffled his interlocutor, had baffled him by turning out to be exactly what he said he was, which contains his own comment, I think, concerning the attitudes Americans have towards each other. He had given my friend a helpful tip. If he wanted to make it in America, it would be better for him not to be seen with niggas. <laughs> my friend thanked him warmly, which brought a glow, I should imagine, to his simple heart. How we adore simplicity and has since made something of a point of avoiding white Americans. I certainly can't blame them. For one thing, talking to Americans is usually extremely uphill work. We are afraid to reveal ourselves because we, are trust, we trust ourselves so little. American attitudes are appalling but so are the attitudes of most of the people in the world. What is stultifying here is that the attitude is presented as the person. One is expected to justify the attitude in order to reassure the person whom, alas, one has yet to meet, who is light years away in some dreadful private labyrinth. And in this labyrinth, the person is desperately trying not to find out what he really feels. Therefore, the truth cannot even be told, even about one's attitudes. We live by lies. And not only, for example, about race, whatever. By this time, 
in this country or indeed in the world. This word may mean a very nature. A lie has penetrated to our most private moments and the most secret chambers of our hearts. The America of my experience has worshiped and nurtured violence for as long as I have been on earth. The violence was being penetrated mainly against black men, though they're strangers, and so it didn't count. But if a society permits one portion of its citizenry to be menaced or destroyed, then very soon, no one in that society is safe. The forces thus released in the people can never be held in check, but run their devouring course, destroying the very foundations which it was imagined they would save. But we are unbelievably ignorant concerning what goes on in our country, to say nothing of what goes on in the rest of the world, and appear to have become too timid to question what we are told. Our failure to trust each other deeply enough to be able to talk to one another has become so great that the people with these questions in their hearts do not speak to them. Our opulence is so pervasive that people who are afraid to lose whatever they think they have persuade themselves of the truth of a lie and help disseminate it. Do not help the innocent here. That man or woman who simply wants to love and be loved. Unless this uh, would-be lover is able to replace his or her her backbone with a steel rod. Here she is doomed. This is no place for love. I know that I am now expected to make a bow in the direction of those millions of unremarked happy marriages all over America, but I'm honestly unable to do so because I find nothing, whatever, in our moral and social climate. And I'm now thinking particularly of the state of our children to bear witness to their existence. I suspect that when we refer to these happy and so marvelously invisible people, we are simply being nostalgic concerning the happy, sinful, God-fearing life which we imagine ourselves to have once lived. In any case, wherever love is found, it unfailingly makes itself felt in the individual, the personal authority of the individual. Judged by this standard, we are a loveless nation. The best that can be said is that Of us are struggling. And what we are struggling against is that death in the heart, which leads not only to shedding of blood, but which reduces human beings to corpses while they live.
light that's in your eyes reminds me of the skies that shine above us every day. So wrote a um, contemporary lover. Uh, God knows what agony, what hope, despair. But he saw the light in the eyes which is the only light there is in the world. Honored it. Trust it. And will always be there to find it. Since it is always there. Hate to be found. One discovers the light in darkness. That is what darkness is for. But everything in our lives depends on how we bear the light. It is necessary, while in darkness, to know that there is a light somewhere, to know in oneself, waiting to be found, there's a light. And what the light reveals is danger, and what it demands is faith. Pretend, for example, that you were born in Chicago and it never had the remotest desire to visit Hong Kong, which is only a name on a map for you. Pretend that by some convulsion, sometimes called accident, throws you into connection with the man or woman who lives in Hong Kong and that you fall in love. Hong Kong will immediately cease to be a name and become the center of your life. And you may never know how many people live in Hong Kong, but you will know that one man or one woman lives there you cannot live. And this is how our lives have changed. This is how we're redeemed. What a uh, journey this life is, dependent entirely on things unseen. If your lover lives in Hong Kong and cannot get to Chicago, it will be necessary for you to go to Hong Kong. Perhaps you will spend your whole life there and never see Chicago again. You will, I assure you, as long as space and time divide you from anyone that you love, discover a great deal about shipping routes, airlines, earthquake, famine, disease, and war. 
you will always know what time it is in Hong Kong. <laughs> because you love someone there. <sighs> I assure you, love will simply have no choice but to go into battle with space and time. Furthermore, to win. I know we often lose and that the death or destruction of another is infinitely more real and more unbearable than one's own. I think I know how many times one has to start again and how one often feels one cannot start again. And yet on pain of death, one can never remain where one is. The light, the light. One will perish without the light. shine forever ride with the wind tonight oh, oh, oh let your love light shine ride with the wind tonight oh, oh, oh let the moon I have slept on rooftops in basements of the I have been cold and hungry all my life I have felt that no fire would ever warm me and no arm would ever hold me. I have been, as the song says, you and scorned. And I know that I always will be. Oh my God, in that darkness which was the lot of my ancestors and my own state, what a mighty fire burned. In that darkness of rape and degradation, that fine, fine froth and mist of blood, through all that terror and all that helplessness, a living soul moved and refused to die. We really emptied oceans with a homemade spoon and tore down mountains with our hands. And if love was in Hong Kong, we learned how to swim. It is a mighty heritage. It is a human heritage. And that's all there is to trust. And I learned this through descending, as it were, into the eyes of my father and my mother. I wondered when I was little how they bore it, for I knew they had much to bear. It had not yet occurred to me that I would also have much to bear, but they knew it. And the unimaginable rigors of their journey helped them to prepare me for mine. This is why one must say yes to life and embrace it wherever it is found, and it is found in terrible places, nevertheless. And there it is. And if the father can say, yes, Lord, that child can learn the most difficult of words. Amen. But nothing is fixed. Forever and forever and forever. It's not fixed. Earth is always shifting. The light is always changing. The sea does not cease to grind down rock. Generations do not cease to be born. And we are responsible for that too. Because we're the only witnesses they have. See the light. The light may have Lovers. Cling to us. We cease to hold each other. The moment we break faith in another, the sea goes up and the light goes out. Shine forever, ride with the wind tonight. Ride with the wind tonight. Oh, let your love light shine. Ride with the wind
We want to thank you for joining us for this powerful performance of Nothing Personal But featuring Coleman, Domingo, Lil Buck, and John Baptiste and directed by Patricia McGregor. And we want to thank you as well for persevering with us through the challenges of doing this in a virtual space. But I think you would agree that this was an incredibly moving and powerful performance. And Patricia, I'm excited to talk to you about this work that you, that we just all witnessed that originally was staged in 2014. I would love to hear your thoughts on um, sort of the similarities and differences in working with this this piece in 2014 versus, you know, obviously uh, the pandemic and this movement that that is now um, uh, really just driving com important conversations forward in 2020. Uh, well. In 2014, Bill T. Jones and the folks at New York Live Arts asked to enliven this poem by Baldwin. And I think what's the same is Baldwin's genius is always there. I mean, he's so, to me, people talk about Shakespeare all the time and I love Shakespeare, but I'm like, Baldwin to me brings everything that Shakespeare brings in that he's he's political, he's personal, he's funny, he's heartbreaking, he's, you know, the he shows the dimensionality of our lived experience in a, in a very real way. And so I think the text is always there. Coleman and I, in that period of time, we had maybe a, a two or three week rehearsal period. And so we, it was more fully staged and, um, you know, it was a, it was a different kind of very theatrical, um, uh, kind of traditional theatrical, uh, uh, endeavor. Um, and this was really us saying, this text still speaks to us. How in this moment, very quickly, you know, I think Coleman wrote me last week or a week and a half ago, something like that, and said, what if we bring that text back and, and join with some other um, deep collaborators and, and just see how this hits us now? So this one feels even more like jazz to me mm -hmm. in that Baldwin's text is, is one of, is the main instrument that we all are riffing off of. And, you know, we had very quick rehearsal times. Coleman and I uh, met briefly, Coleman John and I met briefly, but maybe all together four or five hours um, of just checking in with each other and, and really trying to say, what does this text mean to us now? How does it speak to us today? And, uh, and how can we be with each other and the text? So it felt, it felt more like, um, jazz in a way that wanted to respond to where we really are now and how that meets the text. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was so wonderful to, to have John and Buck in and just see, you know, where this text lands in terms of their musical landscape and how this hits the body. You know, there were, and there were times that we didn't rehearse, you know, that, that moments just hit today from where everyone was feeling. And, and it brought a different kind of meaning to the text than I had heard before seeing but go down into a physicality, you know, that reminded us of what George Floyd went through and, and, and that we're still going through these things. And so, you know, it was just, it was um, exciting and moving to me to collaborate in a new way. And I'd love to, you know, I'm in such admiration of my collaborators that I'd love to bring them in to talk about their experience. Absolutely. We're excited to hear from them as well. Um, oh yeah, here they are. <laughs> hey everybody hey how you doing Fadara? i'm great i'm great well, first of all thank you for what you all just created for us this moment that you created for us and i love what patricia was saying um that this moment this staging of it really felt like jazz and this sort of improvisatory nature and building on what james baldwin gives us in the text and so i wondered if each, each of you could share a little bit about what it was like to bring this to life for us and to breathe words and movement and music into such an important um, text in this moment. Well, I, I guess I'll kick it off by saying I thought the intention was, and the, what, I, what the, the intention was basically, I love these brothers so very much, um, Lil Buck and John, and I respect them. And I think as artists, I know that we try to help translate what's happening um, with our consciousness, with um, what's the pain, the joy, the love, and we can do it through artistry. So I thought, it, in, me and Patricia, we talked about the idea of bringing these um, people of different art forms together and creating that sound together. And in my mind, it becomes um, 
like Baldwin was, he was a preacher. So therefore it feels like a Sunday sermon, which I thought mm-hmm. it's on a Sunday. It's like, you know, for those who are out on the streets or headed to church or going to or coming back, this is all part of the Sunday sermon of uh, taking stock of meditation, of using this language that has been written in, what, in the late 1960s and the text is still, still so relevant. And James Baldwin, I always believe that he is the soul and the consciousness of America because he loves it so much that he's willing to criticize it and challenge us for the ideals that we say that we are and hold us up to our truth and put a mirror on ourselves. And so I thought, what better way to do it but, you know, enlist, you know, two other brothers of mine and we can just, we can riff together. And, and so we don't have to, and, you know, this is the form that we have right now. We don't have to be in our, in our silos. We can come together and strike up some jazz together and be helmed by this phenomenal Patricia McGregor. Yeah. Little Buck and John, would you like to add? Yeah, uh, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. yeah and uh, it, it was it was wonderful. It's always wonderful working with Coleman and working with John, of course. And um, these brothers are so powerful for what they do. And I, I always feel like, um, for me as a performing artist, as a as a dancer, um, you know, um, Nina Simone said it too. You know, you. you you can't be a, a artist and not reflect the times. And, and that's what I try to do as much as possible through my movement. And I always feel like, you know, what, what what's, um, I always try to be the vessel, you know, just a vessel for like what's being emoted, you know, emotionally, uh, spiritually, and, uh, and and from a real point, point of view and, and from the heart. And the way that Coleman emotes uh, these, you know, powerful words and the way that John emotes this, you know his uh, music in, in the powerful way. It it, um, it really brings a lot of strength to what I do, and uh, it gives me, you know, it gives me that, you know, it, it just gives me that essence. It gives me that um, that power of dance. It gives me that power within my dance to be able to, um, you know, speak that language through my movement. So um, uh, I've always wanted to. Um, you know, I've always been a big fan of uh, Baldwin, and I've always, uh, because his words were so powerful, they bring out the power in my movement. And uh, and this has been just, a, you know, one of the most powerful collaborations, you know, I've done even via, you know, online through Zoom, you know. So, uh, so yeah, it, it was just a great experience working with these guys and, um, and really bringing these texts to life and, you know, um, just having this creative dialogue through, um, through movement, through word, and through song. Absolutely. John? Yes, yes. I I think that there's so much there that we discovered today. Yeah. So there's a lot of discovery left to happen, and that's what I was hoping for, but it's even exceeded my expectations. And Coleman is uh, somebody who... We've been talking about finding a way to work together, and Buck and I have worked together, but never the three of us coming together in this virtual platform. And Patricia just blew my mind with the way that she had the whole vision. <laughs> we put this together in, like she was saying, maybe four hours' time when everybody's doing a, a million things and it's on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The idea of what we were able to accomplish makes me almost want to explore the virtual frontier further. That was one of the big takeaways uh, for me. The idea that I could see Buck moving and and it was like (laughs) there were moments where we connected as if we were in the same space but there's something to the virtual aspect of it that makes you even more attentive because there's the delay and there's all the technical things. And then Coleman just driving it, kind of the engine of the piece, just the, the, the heart of it, just trying to follow him and his inflections and his tone as I'm also accompanying. And then sometimes we switch and, and I'm, I'm leading with the song and then he comes back and the timing of that, there's a lot of discovery there. It's, it's exciting as an artist to, to find new mediums like this. It felt that way as one watching it as well. Um, the excitement of 
you know, what we always get from live performance, the emergent, right? It is happening before us, we're engaging it and we're along on this journey. And so that came through in a really powerful way, I think, and I agree with you, John, even heightened by the sense that we're all in this virtual space. <laughs> and, and anything could go wrong and technical oh, difficulties. Like, <laughs> it keeps you like, how, how far can we stay in it and stay com committed to it? And the beautiful thing is all we have is this text, you know, at the center of it is James Baldwin. And I know that, I know that everyone, and I, I feel like that's why I love sharing Baldwin so much. And I know my fellow brothers and sisters love sharing Baldwin. I love sharing it. It's been people wondering, you know, what should we read now? What should we do to enlighten ourselves? I'm like, read some Baldwin because the arguments are there, his heart, his soul, his um, aspirations of what Mer America can be, responsibility of, of our white allies and, you know, loved ones and things like that. I think it's like he puts the responsibility on you with incredible language and everyone is challenged to rise to the occasion. That's why I knew it would be a great challenge as well to be, you know, to work with Buck and John, because I'm like, okay, now you're elevating it again. You got Baldwin and then those who are, you know, on Baldwin, you know, on Baldwin's shoulders, you know? It's like, and I, yeah, it's, it's terrifying and amazing and beautiful at the same time. <laughs> and that, I think one of the interesting things about the form of live stream and even the glitches that we hit is that we all have to hold each other. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys held each other with Baldwin, with a, with a, a technical team talking to each other as we're going. Um, and that there is a, an intensity to the listening. You know, one of my favorite quotes is like, listening is so close to an act of love that most people can't tell the difference. And everyone was listening with their eyes, ears, and hearts to Baldwin and each other in real time. And I think you know, in these times, paralysis, you know, feeling like, well, what can I do? There's so much going on. There's a pandemic and, you know, and we're dealing with this onslaught of continued institutional racism embodied by violence and murder by the police. And, you know, there's so much that you can just feel like, I just can't do anything. But to say, no, I'm going to jump into this new form with this brilliant writer, with these artists that we love and hold each other. And we're going to be all right. Even in the mess, we're going to be all right. And, and then we're going to find beauty in the leap of faith that it takes. And so it is to me a sermon. It is, and even the leap of faith to jump into the unknown, but knowing what we know is that we have each other. And that was so moving to me to see these incredible artists, you know, trust each other, trust the text, trust me, trust everyone to hold each other in it. And, and that's where, that's part of the light for me. Yeah, and I want to add something as well. This um, for those that are that are watching, if they wanted to find nothing personal, the thing that I found when Patricia, Patricia handed it to me in 2014 was the fact that um, it was photography by Richard Avedon, uh, accompanied with uh, James Baldwin text, and those two went to high school together in the Bronx, which already blew me away. And I only knew Richard Avedon for his fashion photography, but I didn't know that he was like such a socially conscious photographer. And so that's incredible. And this text, it was interesting. It was, I feel like it was so radical and raw and beautiful. And then remember Patricia, that it was not, it wasn't reissued for published uh, again since like 1973. Mm -hmm. And I think suddenly it was, it was reissued again in the last like three years. Cause that's when I bought this book. Cause I felt like I've been trying to get it. And so because the, I think because it's completely relevant and I think uh, it was kind of an overlooked text of his. And I think every single argument stands up today, every single one. And although it's incredible, it's also a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're like, wow, this is incredible text. Why was this written in 1964? And now we're still reading this text. So, um, but he does, the thing that I love that he drives home at the end is love. That the heart of James Baldwin was love and hope and integrity. When he says that, you know, lovers cling to each other, children cling to us. If, if to end with that statement is one of the most incredible for someone who's so critical of America and the soul of America, he's like, he's just basically saying, let's hold on to each other and let's not break faith with one another. So that, that that's very spiritual to me. That's, you know, him, he's preaching. <laughs> you know, he said, just don't break faith with one another, have faith with each other. And I think that's the ultimate message of the piece. And I love that out of it, Oh, one other collaborator I need to bring into um, the room is Julie Meretu, who did the incredible paintings, who's, you know, just a phenomenal artist and soul and thinker. And 
as we thought of people, especially because um, this is sponsored by Juilliard, um, collaborators who had worked with Juilliard, we thought uh, having uh, Julie's work, which to me, there's so much space for the cacophonous realities that we live. And so I, I love that this text, uh, we break down the text into different sections so we can kind of process it. But I think um, I experience it like I experience my day where part of my day can feel like a comedy routine. Part of my day feels like uh, very close to a, a, a very um, sad undertow. And then out of the end of that, as Coleman presents, love emerges. So I, I loved that we got to, to use Julie's work as well as a meditative sp space to kind of speak to the multi-layered realities that we live. And then to me, almost like a, a kind of this pure note, this pure thing comes out at the end, which is we must hold on to love despite it all. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Julie as well for thank you for trusting us to join in the conversation. Absolutely. And it's a reminder that the visual arts um, of African and African descended people always have something to say about these things as well. John, I think you wanted to. Oh, no, no. I, I was just going to second that Julie's work was essential. It was amazing to have that part of the tapestry, you know. Beautiful. There were so many powerful moments that happened today. It's hard to kind of like, I was jotting notes as I was watching, but the, you know, the, the whole piece in its entirety is a moment. And there were so many um, really um, kind of poignant moments even within that. And one of them was, uh, and this is a question for Buck, um, when uh, John, you were playing UB Blake's uh, Charleston Rag, I believe, and uh, Buck, you were embodying both this cakewalk dance, this 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 notion of black joy. But I didn't ever really realize until watching you how closely the hand movements in that dance mimic what we've come to understand as movements like uh, hands up, don't shoot, and whatnot. I wondered if you could take us into like how speaking uh, nothing but nothing personal wrestles so much with light and darkness, um, you know, pessimism and optimism. And I feel like that's one of those moments where all of that really kind of comes to bear in such a strong way. Yeah, well, uh, when we were talking about it um, in the rehearsal process, uh, that's um, that, that was the, the feel I got from the sound. Like I always ask myself, what does it sound like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, and when John was playing this music, uh, I actually thought back, uh, you know, to that Charleston kind of cakewalk-ish, you know, uh, dance. And, um, and me, you know, me and Patricia were having dialogue about that. And, and she was actually, uh, gave me the notion of like, how, what, how, what would that look like with, you know, embodying the, the, the hands up thing. And, and as I thought about it, I was like, okay, we kind of have this, you know, I kind of have this swing in my Charleston with these hands up and like just uh, bringing more detail to that and just really realizing, you know, out of all this joy that we're trying to, you know, that we're pushing through with, we're trying to push through with so much, with, with joy to keep us, you know, maintaining, to keep us going. Um, there's always that oppression that comes, you know, to uh, try to bring that down. So is it's, uh, and, and you've seen it for hundreds of years, right? Like, uh, we, we try to find, you know, different ways of maintaining and moving on through all of this, you know, even though that uh, a lot of these things, you know, never seem like they're going to go away. And um, and sometimes they ultimately defeat us, you know, and sometimes we prevail. But um, I just wanted to kind of show that through the movement, you know. Uh, and so it, it slowly trickled from this, you know, kind of joyous, you know, trying to stay in it and maintain and keep going to like this, this, this noticing of the of the hands and and, and where they are and, and and how I'm moving and trying to push through that and just you know constantly being brought down as I'm pushing through my joy. So uh, that's where I was mentally with that. Uh, uh, Patricia helped out a lot. John helped out tremendously. Coleman helped out amazingly with his with his with his text and uh, to, for me to really bring that to life. So um, it, it, it is. You know, uh, I, I often say it, but like just the power of collaboration, especially with these 
amazing black artists right here is just um it, it it does a lot for me and for my movement and for my language so um thank you bud yeah it was such a joy too because i feel like with this group there's so much um there's so much trust and respect and such a shorthand so especially in a short process you can drop in you know i felt like my job was to like i'm a Set some shots or set some things and then just drop in. I dropped two or three words or like a little hint or a question. And then they just created these beautiful, like beyond my imagination ways of processing what that would mean or embodying what that would mean. And that's such a joyful thing. I mean, Coleman, Coleman, I know very well. John and I met at Summer Stage when he was doing a concert at Summer Stage. He blessed my son with the gift of music. Buck, I've admired for so long, but I've never met. So we, having never been in a room together, there's just something to having like shared language, shared respect that allowed it to just flow. And no, it, it, hopefully it felt like nobody was pushing anyone's borders, but everyone was just inspiring each other in very shorthand. You know, J John often says, that's a vibe. You know, <laughs> so we kind of give a little vibe in and everyone flowed in such a beautiful way. It was really inspiring to see. Well, the audience agrees with you all. They say that they felt, they felt that sermon vibe, that kind of church service vibe and love. Oh, yeah the interdisciplinary collaboration between the arts, you know, um, the vibe. I feel like we need that more. <laughs> the interdiscipline collaborations, uh, I, I just love it. You get so much out of it. I'm sorry to cut you off, but yeah. No, you're that, fine. That's what I live for, you know. I have a question for Coleman. In, in, in um, preparing the, the text, I've, I've listened to a fair amount of James Baldwin speaking and I could see you bringing in different inflections of his. Was that a conscious choice or is that just embedded in the text to kind of the, the cadence and the approach? Yes and yes. I think, <laughs> I think it's not just where I drop my voice where, you know, I, I you know, especially listen to Baldwin speak all the time. It's like, I could, I could you know, it's just like where but also it lives in the rhythms of his, of his language. It truly does. And I think if you just, you stay with that language, which is, you know, I'm just scrolling up and I'm like, you stick with that and you've got it. He's got, and it's like, you ha have to use every comma, every period. And it sounds just the way Baldwin speaks. I mean, that's actually, he's actually a writer who really does write the way he speaks. And you see how he has, he will have parenthetical after parenthetical after parenthetical. When we, when we were memorizing it in 2014, that was the most difficult thing because we were like, he will he will go around to get right back to it to finish the thought and it was so difficult to find the way he actually goes in but once you get it you understand it makes complete sense because he can he'll throw up a, a, like five thoughts and say i'm going to be right back with that hold on blah, blah, blah. i'm going to bring this back around and then it's like oh that's the only way it was supposed to be spoken you know so that's very baldwin so i think that you know hopefully i, I truly hope that um my goal always, which is why I was listening to some Mahalia Jackson before I started, was to also just, you know, invoke some of his spirit and just say, Baldwin, let me go on the journey with you. And uh, I know that Mahalia Jackson was his favorite singer. I'm like, I listened to some Mahalia while I was in the shower and I'm like, Baldwin, come on, come, help me. I, like you said, Buck, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, the, I'm the vessel. I said that in this musical passage, strings. people might be laughing. But anyway, the, I truly am, I truly believe that we try to be the vessel and then let, let his words speak through me and just um, center myself in the moment and center it with you guys and take in your, your, your physical language and your musicality and just trust it. And I think that's when Baldwin comes alive, truly. Mm. One of the things, speaking of continuing in, in the rightful veneration of Baldwin, one of the things Patricia and I spoke about earlier was um, I said, Baldwin is rightfully quoted all the time now. Like if you're on your social media feeds, you you hear and read different quotes of his, snippets of interviews. But one of the things I was really excited about, and you all sharing this work with us, is that we get this interpretation of a longer form of Baldwin. It isn't just the quotes that, you know, the short snippets that can fit in the Instagram fake, um, frame that get pulled out, 
But this piece really calls for us to slip deeper inside the world of Baldwin and really take his statements um, in their entirety and in and, and larger doses. And I'm thinking about, Patricia, what you said with us, shared with us earlier about listening and how that in and of itself is an act of love. And so I wanted to know what you all think about the fact that, you know, this performance is being sponsored by Juilliard, but the fact that the world is now more closely listening to the voices of Black people about their experiences. And this was obviously a moment where people have gathered to listen to the works uh, and, the, and the sentiment of Baldwin as embodied through what you all gave us today. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that act of listening to Black voices, um, whether it's through this sort of artistic means, um, rhetorical means, dramatic means that you all share with us today, or if it's just the voices that are am being amplified on the streets as well. I'll leave this by saying, I think we, were, we have all been raised um, in American culture to listen as African-Americans. We listen, we learn, we know, the history of America. A lot of times it excludes our own history and then we have to search for it. And then once we search for it, we find it, but we realize that the, our others have not been able to, have not been privy to that same information. So I think now's the time we're saying, we, we need you to listen as well. We've all, we've all, we've, we, like, trust me, I, I know all the history of, of you. And now we're saying, listen to me and really listen. Because I think li the listening is kind of a hard part, but it's also an easy part, right? Because right now there's a lot of reactionary um, uh, reaction from people who are like trying to do something like you know our you know wonderful white allies or you know they're activated. I, I want to do something. What can I do? And I constantly say the best thing you can do is just listen, get information. Change doesn't happen overnight. You know, doing a PSA with all your friends talking about when you take responsibility that's not working. But you, we've all seen it. But what I'm saying is, what you can actually do it is just be, be silent right now. Do the work learn, listen, have, but also have those conversations as well. Have conversation, but when you're having a conversation, to actively listen, to really listen, not to respond, not to be defended, not to defend, not to make it about you, but to really listen. And so I think that that's, um, it, sound, it seems, it can be kind of hard in our culture, but I think it's actually, the act of it is very loving and actually easy if you just let go and just trust that you don't, you don't have to be on, you don't have to feel any kind of way about it. You can just actually just receive. Yeah. One of my one of my favorite things about Zoom is that I at a certain point have to press mute. And as a director, I'm not used to pressing mute. I'm I'm often unmuted and I feel like the world needs to press mute sometimes mm -hmm. and actually let the voices in front of you be heard uninterrupted. Not waiting for the retort or the defense or 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 to assimilate what you're hearing into a monolith of representation because that's the other thing is like often people will say oh well my one black friend from high school and so you know and it's like no there's not a monolithic experience and also we within sometimes i'm feeling very graceful and sometimes i'm feeling full of rage and you might have to listen to me differently in five minutes than in five days. And so I just think, yeah, that idea, it's very humbling to mute yourself and be and, and listen, but it's actually the space where you learn the most and then you can hopefully be filled up and ready for a real dialogue and then hopefully some action. But listening is the space where we, where we learn. I have a, a almost two year old and her active listening is so intense. She listens with her body because she doesn't assume she knows everything. And I feel like that's what we all need to do to with each other is like, let's listen with our full bodies, our hearts, our ears, our minds, our eyes, so that we can actually learn something, not just repeat the cycle that we thought was like the way the world goes that we decided at 17 years old. I want to share that um, at the conclusion of this, Juilliard will share some organizations and action items that they think we all can take to help bring forward the change that we're pushing for. But we also, in the spirit of listening, want to solicit the ideas of others because as an institution, none of us knows everything. And so it's a constant exchange between 
information that we've gathered and in taking new information as well. So if you have suggestions um, or things that you think are worth noting and important, please share them in the comments on the Facebook stream as well so that we can be attentive to those. Um, we have a few more moments and I want to, a lot of people are asking and interested in Baldwin as they should always be. And so I wanted to ask you all if you have recommendations of where one should start with Baldwin. If there are, are, are unfamiliar, um, I will step out there first and say, I went on a Baldwin deep dive many years ago, but I've learned that you have to return to texts, especially those by James Baldwin. And so I'm currently right now rereading The Fire Next Time. Um, it's a book that gets heavily referenced, but I said, I need to take a moment and start with this text by myself all over again. So. Um, Yes, Coleman, I see you uh, holding up. The fire next time, yes, yeah. absolutely, which is incredible. And, um, you know, uh, Tashin has actually come out with this book with uh, Steve Shapiro, Photography, which is really incredible, too. So I feel like if you're someone who wants to be, need some imagery as well, it's really great. I really support that, The Fire Next Time. It really just gives you context for everything. So, yeah. And I'll also double down and say, James Baldwin, Just Above My Head, is a great book and also here's um Baldwin's biography which is also pretty awesome and then one of my favorites is another country mm -hmm. and I have Giovanni's room I just don't know where it is <laughs> I'd also say we're so lucky that Baldwin was videotaped mm -hmm. and so watching some of Baldwin speak in interviews he has so many interviews and it's kind of like knowing the person's voice before you hear the song yeah. I think hear the musicality, you get the passion, you get, you know, that he's often, I mean, his mind is so brilliant and his heart is so warm, which often we try to cut those two things off. And I think you see embodied in him in these um, uh, videos is that, you know, you're like, you would be fun on the dance floor. Like one of my favorite pictures is him and Lorraine Hansberry, like you are fun. Yes. You would be fun party and that's important to know as part of the resistance like joy is part of resistance and and loving each other and holding each other and and also you know pain like you hear him you hear him seek and you see his face and you can see the way the pain hits his face he he says people often go to anger because beneath anger i'm misquoting him but the sentiment is beneath anger is pain and I think sometimes when you watch these videos, you can just get a sense of him. And then I think that helps when you're reading The Fire Next Time or, or those other things is you can, you can get a sense of his voice and his being um, and the way that, that helps to um, serve the words in a way. Mm -hmm. There's one, one um, uh, debate in particular that I love to watch that was at Cambridge uh, between William F. Buckley and James Baldwin. It's mm -hmm. essential. Before you even crack open some Baldwin, Go to YouTube and look at that and get get your entire life involved. Yeah, yes. It's I'm Not Your Negro is the, the film about mm -hmm. that debate. Yes. For those folks who uh, check Netflix out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we want to thank you all for what you have given us today, um, given us as a it, it was both the church service and Sunday dinner and that it was a feast of, of ideas and beauty and material for us to draw from in such changing times, necessarily changing times. And so we would invite our audience to stay tuned um, to uh, Juilliard's Facebook and social media properties as we will continue this dialogue. And please, on our feeds, continue in thanking these artists for joining us for such an important performance today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, it was great. A lover's question. I meant to say, I wanted to say that as far as his album, like that's the album I listened to where like I, I discovered Precious Lord, like that song that was one of my favorite songs to actually dance to. And I really felt them and I felt everything that Patricia and Coleman uh, were speaking about when it comes to his, you know, his pain and his, you know, his power and, and all of it. So I just want to throw that out there, uh, uh, a lover's question on, you can iTunes it and, and find it. And uh, yeah, you should listen to that whole thing. But that was it. Thank y'all so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. This has been, what a blessing. Thank you. Very much.